a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain, and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, In the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt, Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Well, we got through verse 1 last week, and who was Jude addressing his letter to? Just, yes, it's to the, through the Holy Spirit, to the whole church, but who's he addressing the letter to at the moment that he's writing it? This isn't the answer you want, but I think he's very concerned about people being receptive of false doctrine. People who are not on their guard, people who say, well, Dell's really a good guy, even though Dell is one of those that were claimed there a long time ago to destroy the fellowship. Uh, I, I just don't think, I think that's behind it. That's not, that's not the answer you want, but I know that, I know that that's a concern of his. Okay. I feel strongly that's a concern of his. That uh, there are people in there, and you people just don't understand that you're under attack. <clears throat> Much the way our country is, uh, there are people planted here, and they they aim to do you harm, or they aim to change your way of thinking, and that's what I think they're after. You. 
hero to the Jewish and Gentile Christians. Right. right. In, in the immediate context, it's just the congregation wherever the letter was initially sent, right? We don't know exactly where that congregation was. It was in... He's from the Church of Jerusalem. Right, but it could have been written to a, a 10 people. It could have been written to 100 people. It could have been written to 1,000 people, depending upon... It was written in about 60 or 65, roughly, um, so by then, things were getting pretty bad. Remember all the times we've talked about how bad Rome was getting near 70 AD, right? So he wrote it to a group of people who needed to contend for the faith, and we're going to talk about that today. And like, I like what Gary said. It was addressed to an entire congregation. What was the makeup of that congregation? Rudy said, Jewish and Gentile believers. You could say former Jews, right? Or Jews by heritage that have become Christian. Once you're, if you're following Judaism, you're not a Christian. You can be a former Jew in a sense. There were those in the congregation who were stumbling in their faith. He wanted to write them something, but he couldn't. And there were false teachers, like Gary said in the congregation. So there were those who were Christians who were stumbling, not dealing well, and there were those who were just out and out false teachers. Which is interesting because he then says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you, and he's addressing it to all of them. With false teachers in their midst, why would he greet them with this greeting? May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Kind of sounds like Paul with his letters. I mean, his greetings, his salutations. He wants them to repent. He's wanting to be able to talk to them. Remember how Paul talked to the Galatians? He talked to them a little bit like dear children, and he wanted to, you could say, keep a dialogue open. My, my dear children, I have to write to you and tell you something you're doing wrong. And, and so he didn't just come in and immediately shotgun blazing, you know, take him out. He wants, he's got a relationship with them. If he is an elder or a pastor over a congregation, somebody who's um, responsible for their you know, position, I guess, for what he's taught them. He wants to approach them all in that manner. Plus, just like Steve said, it was a common greeting. Paul used that kind of language, not those exact three words, grace, uh, mercy, peace, and love. A lot of times it was grace and peace. But Peter did. Peter did. Okay, read from Peter. And his, his, uh, Second Peter? Both of them. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's first Peter. Second Peter says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus. Yeah, grace love. and peace. Yeah. Grace and peace. Here it's mercy and peace. Yeah, and love. And love. So, this is the, the example you just spoke of from First um, Peter. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, grace, peace. This is a greeting. This is how he's starting the letter. It's interesting to keep in mind that there are sections of scripture that are just greetings. They're just openings to letters. And you kind of start at the end of that with more serious stuff. Sometimes there's a punch in there, right? But here he's saying, he's addressing them, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ for sprinkling with his blood. What about that? I hope it's more sincere than you sometimes hear uh, when you have a guest preacher come in or something and they say, oh, I bring greetings to you from a brotherhood in St. Louis who uh, send their greetings and, you come on, they don't even know he's here. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say last week that 
a lot of times we were taught in the past to write letters in a similar fashion. We would write a letter with a salutation. And it would be, dearest grandmother, I hope that you are well. I hope that this finds you in good health. I hope that all is well with you. Now let me tell you about what's going on in, in our family. You know, there was a greeting. Nowadays, a lot of people just start right out with, here's what's going on. There was just something nice about that kind of a salutation and greeting. I had a good friend in college. <clears throat> Whenever he would meet anybody, he'd start out with a question. How's your family? How are you? How, you know, and if he knew someone in their family, he would say, well, how is Sally doing? It, you know, very general, but I always started that way then. I've been visiting my sister or whatever, you know, instead of that, but how are you? How's your family? How's your wife? Um, when you read a letter like that, <clears throat> with an opening like that, you feel a certain way. You feel concern from the person and care from the person. Maybe they're just going through the motions. Who knows? Like when somebody says, how are you doing? And you go, uh, well, let me, t and they shut you down right away. I was telling my wife this yesterday. I said, Sometimes you, people ask you how you're doing, and, and they, you can see them glass over as soon as you start to tell them how you're doing. They really just wanted to hear, I'm fine. But these letters were serious. These were, were pastoral type letters, and they were being written to congregations. And in this case, he's writing a serious letter to the congregation. Though the congregation was troubled by division and false teaching, they were all addressed as God's chosen people, for they were all called by the gospel even those who were in this congregation teaching falsely. There were probably, Paul had people that just kind of came in after him that weren't necessarily saved. This gives you the impression that he's writing it to the entire congregation. He's not saying, hide this letter from those who are false teachers, because they don't know who the false teachers necessarily are. It's being read to everybody. How would you do that anyway? How would you know? Well, we're going to get there. Um, jumping ahead. Verse 3. Beloved. Beloved. Do you have to say beloved? You can say beloved. Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. What would you have rather done? It's right about good stuff in Jesus. And Jesus blesses you. And Jesus is good. Jesus died for you. Uh, you Save your soul. All that good stuff we all know. Yeah. That was his preference. He would have preferred to write a nicer letter about their common salvation, their common faith in Jesus Christ. Well, what is this common <clears throat> salvation of which he speaks? What makes it common, I guess, or is it shared? It's a shared thing. It's a faith shared by all believers. Our common salvation. You have the same common salvation as Christians in Africa, as Christians in South America, as Christians in the Eastern Bloc, as it were. You have the same common salvation. If they are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You have small C Catholic faith. Yes, the universal, the, the small C Catholic faith. Last night there was a special on television about a Christian, a Christian church in Iran that was, the, the whole group of them were leaving Iran and were going to Slovakia. And uh, their pastor led them. They had a final worship in their church in, in Iran, and they were fleeing for their life all of them together, and they were they were uh, sponsored by a Christian church in uh, Slovakia. And what was really neat about it is they didn't speak the same language, but at the end they were in a joint worship service. And their pastor, their, their Slavic pastor, and the Iranian pastor were both in front leading their congregations at the same time. And uh, I went, and then. 
think it was CBS, really did a good job of saying because they worship the same Savior. Uh, you know, and, and then at the, the very end, I was really impressed with this, and how well this was going and, and, and these, these Slovakians and how they were taking them in and because there were like 50 or 70 of them, there was a lot of them. And uh, at the very end, it said, if you'd like to contribute and, and help these people, uh, uh, and help these Christians and Muslims. <laughs> there wasn't one word about a Muslim in that whole thing, uh, but then at the very end, you could help these Christians and Muslims. Well, the Muslims were the ones killing the Christians, for God's sake. You know? uh, but they didn't say that. But it was, I was impressed that there was a commonality, that, that they, could, they could both worship the same Savior. They were both expecting the same Savior to come or something. They made a very vivid point out of uh, these people are Christians. That's what happened in Serbia. Most of them were Wales, and then the other ones were uh, German. And uh, so because German was uh, more predominant than Wendish, then they accepted the German. And so that's, uh, and even now, they still play. The Windish theme or music and the German, and the German has a little more bounce to it than the Windish one. One was a little more subdued than the other. Yeah, bounce. better music. <clears throat> Jeff's brother, Andy, uh, uh, was teaching at international school in Prague, and he went to St. Michael's Lutheran <clears throat> Church, and in that church they had three services on Sunday in three different. Uh, one is in uh, Czech and one's in English, and I forget what the third one is. <clears throat> but they all share the same church, and which was built in about 1100. And uh, I think it's very interesting to use a Lutheran service book uh, for their services in English. And a uh, missionary from Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, is a pastor. They moved to Turkey. They live in Antalya, Turkey, a seaport of the Mediterranean Sea. And they still go to a Christian church. And they still talk about, like you say, the same Lord, the same, the same baptism. That's what Paul wrote. I have had they, friends who've moved. Uh, to great. <clears throat> well, Prague, he was there, and then they moved to Turkey, and he has a special missionary can't talk about. If, he, if I talk about it, he talks about it. If some Muslim could get a connection there and they could be deported immediately. Um, yeah, we well, don't want they that. They moved from Prague to Turkey. Yes. <clears throat> and he'll be here, by the way, at the end of January. Oh, nice. I hope he has a chance to have a chance and opportunity to talk to the people here about their project. <clears throat> We've had people come to the men's club and talk about projects. They usually, they have to wait until usually it's over with. But this one guy came and talked about audio, uh, radios, or Benson Bytel. whatever. It was a wonderful presentation. Anyway, moving on. Um, I have a comment about the difference in translations. You guys follow along up there while I read out of the real translation here. <laughs> this is the real <laughs> translation. Dear King friends, so there's a difference already. They're beloved. These are dear friends. Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation. Uh, we share. That's we share. common we salvation. Common. All right. Mm -hmm. I felt I had to write and urge you, urge you, to contend for the faith. All right. That was once for all entrusted. The world of difference between being something if you're entrusted with something and it's just delivered to you. Trusted to the saints. No, I believe that's I believe that's huge because what it's saying is that and who was it? Billy Graham or somebody said it that we're only one generation away from being heathens. Because if we don't pass it down to the children, it is entrusted to you. It's just not delivered to you. And I really wonder Well, it's entrusted to you to deliver it. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. It says, yes, yes. Do what? The real NIV. <laughs> the original 84 NIV. I like the ESV, but you have I don't, to. I don't like it at all. The, the Greek word there uh, for deliver is used with childbirth. I, that's interesting. 
you're not entrusting your child. They're yeah. concerned with childbirth for once of delivered to the saints. It's a it's a delivery and it's in childbirth, being born new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you think about the word that, that actually is there, this is the more accurate translation. Entrusted has its value, but and it's not necessarily like throw your NIV out because they used entrusted. But if memory serves me, the King James says delivered. Well, then it must be right. Hey, well, I'm just saying, if you want to argue about tradition, it's all delivered. I'm just yeah. saying delivered is not an innovation. No. And the NIV is more dynamic equivalence. This is the ESV. It says delivered. Right. The NIV's point literal. is to get a point across. Whereas... Well, I think another thing, too, is what is the context of what he's saying? He's not saying we're entrusting this to you to pass it on. I mean, that's understood, but I don't think that's his point. I think his point, because he says once for all delivered, meaning yeah, we're gonna talk a he, bit he's, he's, to me, he's making the same point that Paul made in Galatians when he said, don't follow another gospel. The one that you heard from us, mm -hmm. stick to it, mm -hmm. is what he's saying. He's saying Christ and the apostles entrusted the faith to the saints, don't deviate. It is exactly that in my understanding where it's don't go you were given a gospel don't go changing it right you were delivered a, a particular message it's the message you have it's the message you are entrusted with but it's the, what we delivered to you i mean i think gary's point is a wonderful point but at the same time if, if you took it to that mean that entrusted to be passed on then that means that god only entrusted it to one generation no and this means it was right. entrusted to every generation but it says once for all delivered. Look at the line above it. He said, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to do what? To, to contend, contend for the faith. What, is that? what does contend mean? Well. Oh, there you go. Fight for the faith. What does contend mean? <laughs> Put a different word in there. Fight, fight for the faith. Fight. fight. It okay, means so to fight. Fight for the faith. The case, what are you willing to fight for? What are you willing to fight for when it comes to the gospel? What are you willing to give your life for? Why is Jude asking them what? Why is Jude asking them to fight for this common salvation? I think it refers to what's going on uh, with the people during that time. It was a struggle to be a Christian. Once you've been delivered the gospel, once somebody has spoke the words of salvation, and you have been given faith, and you are now a child of God. What worse thing could happen to you than for somebody to come and take that away from you by false teaching? What faith? What faith? He's asking us to fight for the apostolic teachings. That's what was passed on to them. When Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 something, very important, right? We're going to think we're going to get there. But he's also asking them to fight for the Old Testament. He's not saying just fight for the New Testament. He's saying fight for the scriptures. Contend for the faith because the faith was delivered from the beginning to the end. That's what the Bible is doing. It's delivering Jesus. It's placing Jesus in our ears. Right? How about that? The Bible being preached, the word being preached and taught rightly is putting Jesus into your ears. Just like at the communion, they're placing Jesus in your mouth. Yeah. Pastors deliver. Rightly sermon. understood. In that sense, the pastors deliver a sermon. Um, they present it to a dozen private apostles. They talk. Pastors are are handed over the apostolic teachings and, and the New and Old Testament, the prophets. We're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's what pastors are handed over, and that's what pastors are intended to deliver. When people come into congregations like Jude's congregation here, and they start perverting that gospel, they're not being faithful to their calling. I don't believe we're involved in a perverted perversion of the gospel as much as we're involved in a, uh, a lackadaisical attitude towards the gospel. 
we had a family, a German girl, I was a foreign exchange student, and they, uh, when they picked her up in the first Sunday, they asked her, they said, look, we're Christians, so we would really like for you to come with us to church. And she said, oh, sure, I want the full experience. So they said, well, do you ever go to church there? No, I never go to church. <laughs> what about your mom and dad? Oh, yeah, well, they go Christmas and Easter. What about your grandparents? They go every Sunday. What happened? Yeah. Failed to pass down the treasure. Um, Is there another, a quick, another quick story. I have an older brother who's a Lutheran principal up in Sioux City, Iowa. He was talking to a guy one day, and a guy says to him, he says, boy, I'll tell you what, I won't make my kids go to church. That's their choice. My parents did that to me all the time. Make me get up and go to church. Boy, I'll tell you, I build up a resentment against that. And my brother says, yeah, but you're still here. Even after all the resentment he had, he was a faithful member. But he wasn't passing it down. And I think it's, it's part of contending for the faith is is planting that seed again and again and again and again and again and again and again. again. Non-negotiable seed. The same, the same people would never think about not having a fully vaccinated. What? Well, some of them would. Or, 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 or not to brush their teeth, or, or not to eat, or not to eat their veggies. Or... More, more generic than that, if your child, if you live up in Alaska, are you going to send your child out into the elements without a coat? Because you're going to leave it up to them as to whether they go out with a coat or not. And they would go out without a coat. Yes. I have children. I can guarantee that. I had. I have children who I have said, you need to put a coat on. And they're like, it's fine. I don't need a coat. And then they come back with a runny nose. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. This is 1 Corinthians 15, if I'm not mistaken. It is the gospel in a nutshell. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I, what I also received. Again, the delivered word. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. So if you want to check out whether I'm telling you the truth or not, here's 500 witnesses. Go ask them some questions. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, to all the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preached, so we believe. That's an, a very important passage of Scripture. Yeah, Chris, I think, I, I, I guess I can speak for myself, but I think there's others too that forget the eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And we read the scriptures, but if we don't realize that other people saw Jesus alive and not just the 12 or 11, uh, we miss a lot. That That is what we build our hope on, that Paul wrote about that too. If, it, if he didn't, if he wasn't resurrected, then our faith is all in vain. And that's why to us to be reminded of the the witnesses, the people who ate with him, talked with him, walked with him uh, after he rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know, that's what we build our resurrection hope on. Modern day prophets, otherwise known as latter day saints. If they if, if they have a leader who says God appeared to me, the Holy Spirit appeared to me, Jesus appeared to me. They have a tradition within that church, I believe, that, if I'm not mistaken, that there were other people who have seen these golden plates that are, just don't exist anymore, kind of a thing. I don't think so. The men who signed this the preface who, to the Book of Mormon. Right. But open the, any copy, there's a letter in the front. There is no way to validate whether those men actually saw it or not, but it's a small group of people 
they still don't have them to present, right? So there's, there's a difference between one guy who goes off into the wilderness, whether it's Joseph Smith or Muhammad, and comes back and says, I have a new revelation, believe me, and the apostles and the 500. Well, there's also the credibility of the eyewitness. If you spend time researching the early days of Mormonism, it becomes pretty clear that there were some very shady things going on. And I wouldn't trust Joseph Smith to mow my grass, much less. But he'd be a great neighbor, Jim. No, he wouldn't. Some of his followers are, but Just, you know, no, I understand. It's an eyewitness. It doesn't make them automatically credible. The, the, the lengths to which Mormons like Glenn Beck and other people go to to defend the history of their own um, beliefs is just kind of crazy sometimes. Well, Ken. Can you go back one slide? Please? I can. For, his, uh, for I am the least of the apostles. I'm worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Uh -huh. Now, did Jude, the writer of Jude, do that? Uh, I thought that was... Uh, this is Paul. not Jude. I, when I started this slide, I said this is actually 1 Corinthians. It's Paul. This is Paul who is, yeah, yeah, who is writing to the church in Corinth saying, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because sure. before I, Jesus appeared to me, I killed these people. Sorry, I, I thought I made that clear before, but yeah, it's this is a uh, this is what a lot of people will call the gospel in a nutshell: that Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture, and that He appeared. He was really resurrected, and then of course He ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. All that, but this is the gospel in a nutshell. Somebody says, "Tell me the gospel." Go to First Corinthians 15 and read. Or memorize it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There's this faith that is meant to be kept. And sometimes that's actually referring to what was passed on, what was delivered. I've kept what was given me. I have not changed it. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Uh, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter, but not, uh, not many are able. The narrow door is Jesus, right? He is the way. You can't take that gospel that was once for all delivered to the saints and start adding to it. You start widening the door, because we want to get all these people into the church. So here's a great way to do that. Let's start widening the, the gospel out a little bit. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive perishable wreath, a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. This faith, this Christianity, is a thing that has to be fought for or defended, apologized for, but not in the way that you think. You have to be willing to do apologetics. It means say you're sorry. I'm not sorry for Christianity, but here, let me explain it to you. There's another comment like this that <clears throat> a long time Lutheran claims that uh, Lutherans don't do a good job of explaining the faith to other people. They just said, believe in Jesus, or I believe in Jesus, and stop it. They don't say who Jesus is, what he did, what he means, and all that. But it's just sort of a, a bumper sticker kind of faith. It's kind of sad when we can't go beyond I just believe and that's it. You know, what Pastor just said reminded me uh, when C.S. Lewis was talking about the Trinity and he said he used to, during the war, he used to go to army camps and give talks to the men. And he said this one RAF officer came up in this hard-bitten veteran, he said, and he said, I've got no use for all that theology stuff. He said, no, he said, I believe in God. I've been out in the desert at night and I felt a tremendous mystery. But all this, all your little categories and all your little explanations, they don't mean anything to someone who's 
known the real thing. And C.S. Lewis was very nice. He said, well, I think that man had a real experience of God out in the desert. But he said, theology is like a map. What's more exciting, looking at a map of the Atlantic or being on the beach? And he said, well, being on the beach. He said, but, but taking walks on the beach is not going to get you to America. So he said, theology at first seems more uninteresting and not as real as what it talks about, but in order to guide you in the right direction, you have to have a map. You cannot just have a religion of music and flowers. It's not going to get you anywhere. If you are led somewhere by your own experience, as opposed to by something from outside of you, some truth coming in from outside of you, you could end up in the right place, but you very easily could end up in the wrong place because you're relying on your own emotions, your own feelings, your own whatever. If you rely strictly on, uh, for the important part of it, right, let's say, if you rely on the external word of God being preached and taught, no matter how you feel that day, you can rely on that. Because it's very easy to end up saying, well, you know, you know, just not in the mood to believe today or whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> theology is how can you love a God that you don't know and how can you know a God without theology theology is something that I think many churches are leaving behind they're much more interested in your sociability mm -hmm. uh, your rapport with your fellow believers your uh, <clears throat> feeling good about your faith and uh not feeling condemned in any way. And I think the, the great loss is theology. Um, feeling good doesn't get you to heaven. Chris? Ken? In regard to what Pastor Zimmer was saying a while ago, I, I agree with him 100%, and I don't know how to correct him. But you take the Mormons, I mean, there, I have, I mean, I, I've said it before in these classes, the Mormons have a conviction, they have a, I, I mean, their faith shows, they care about their fellow man. I've, I've seen two or uh, two instances, strong instances in the third one, uh, where they would give up what they're doing to help somebody else. I've personally seen that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure Lutherans, a lot of Lutherans would do that. And some of them would, some of them wouldn't. But I mean, when you go into a Mormon situation like I was last summer in St. George, Utah, I didn't stay there for long. I mean, you felt, and you felt good. I mean, you, I mean, you felt that you were among friends. You, you didn't have to have your guard up. And uh, th there's a difference there. And I, I, like Gary was saying, uh, it depends on how you well fit in in, in many Lutheran circles. Go ahead. Uh, I, my niece is married to a former Mormon. Is her her husband's father was a judge in a town in St. George, Utah, and his son, the husband of my niece, gave up Mormonism to come become a Christian. No one in the town, because of like 90% Mormon would never talk to him. Didn't share anything. He was shunned. It was sort of like uh, the Amish. Mm -hmm. uh, they give up the Amish faith. Uh, they just, they, he had to move because he just couldn't get a job. He couldn't get anything. Uh, my sister lives in Las Vegas. She goes to a grocery store. I went with her. And people ahead of us, when they got checked out the groceries, they were given lower prices by the Mormon clerk to the Mormons ahead of us. We just saw it. And they said, well, why don't I get that same price? Are you a Mormon? Prove it. <laughs> I said, no. OK, you get this price. Boom. Uh, and so that had like the yeah, uh, But they are friendly uh, until. I bet, I bet at first they were approached 
Yeah, it's as if on the cash register there's a, a, a big M, and if you're a Mormon, they push the M button and it changes all the prices. And you better not give up the Islam religion either. Right. That, think about it. Think about all the false religions, a lot of the false religions. If you give up Mormonism, if you give up Islam, if you give up a lot of, they, they, you, you, they turn their backs on you. Whereas if Christianity, you start wandering away from the faith in Christianity, you get a letter like this. I'm content for the faith, folks. You know, let's talk about this. Let's get deeper into the, the faith and the theology. Let's fight for this. This is worth fighting for. You know? Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of, of you <clears throat> that you are standing firm in one spirit, <clears throat> contending for the faith, standing firm in the spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Man. Nothing is more bound to happen but disturbing than that there are so many ways that people approach things, and that creates all this disunity. I think that the last uh, four words are critical. Faith of the gospel. Because if, if, he could just say, for the gospel. Mm -hmm. But he emphasized the faith. Of, that comes from the gospel. Mm -hmm. That I think I don't know. I I'm new here. I'm still new after a year. That <laughs> I don't hear people talking about the faith they have in the good news of Jesus Christ. They like friendship and all that is there, but um, and I don't do it. I put my faith in Jesus. Christ. And, rem and look, it doesn't say, and, and I have kept faith. It's, I have kept the faith. And They're, also striving. It's singular on purpose, right? It's striving. It's a, it's a tense in Greek. It means it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. You don't get it and have it and been confirmed and that's it. So I guess I'm here today because I'm still striving. Hopefully, side by side. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> side by side. We, we come to hear the word preached and taught, and to study the word to do that, to strive to be of this um, one mind, side by side. I think we need to also to get back to what Gary and uh, Ken were saying. I think we need to we have to we need to we need to get the best of both worlds, like. Ken said, you know, you've got the Mormons and other groups, you know, they're very welcoming. Well, I think the solution to that is we Christians need to be more welcoming. Because sometimes we'll go, well, those people make you feel welcome. We have the truth, and that should be enough for you. Well, we need to have the truth and be more welcoming. Likewise, Gary, he said, good feelings don't get you into heaven. That's very true. But I'll tell you what, if I come to church and every time I leave, I feel worse than when I entered the door, I'm not coming back. I don't care how true it is. You haven't been delivered the gospel properly if you, have, exactly. if, if you leave I mean, feeling worse. You You're know, supposed to feel bad during the service, which some people don't want to let people do. But you need to leave feeling the blessing of the gospel, right? Okay. Most of us probably remember the days when children didn't go up to the communion rail. You sat in the queue with your parents. Or, or you sat in the queue, and your parents went up to communion, and you just sat there, right? You didn't go up there. They didn't do the blessing thing. I remember sitting there as a kid, watching my parents and all the other older people go up to take communion. And one of the things I always remember is how serious people's expressions were. You know, you would think they were going to a firing squad, okay? I mean, I understand they probably didn't mean to look gloomy. And I'm sure they were just trying, this is a solemn moment. And it is, and it's serious, and it is. And that's all to the good. They're just being reverent. But it would be nice if more people looked happy when they came back from Holy Communion. And sometimes you see that. But again, I, you can't always judge what people are thinking based on their facial expression. I'm sorry, Jim, I've told you you're not allowed to smile. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and I'm not saying put on a happy face with everything. Hey! Do cartwheels back Christ. to you, too. Right? Yeah. Actually, yeah. actually, you've told me the opposite. It's, just, it's okay to smile, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, years, yeah. And years and years ago, we had a young couple come down named Jim and Darla Wilson. And Darla was always a talent, a singing talent. And in the old 85 church, 
uh, Pastor Bells asked her if she would sing in front of the church. Why in front of church? I don't know. Because that's she worked with me down. You know, I was the pastor again. So she said, oh, "Okay." So she's up there, and I realize what it's like because I used to help a lot with communion. And talk about gloomy gusses. The whole congregation is a bunch of gloomy gusses when you're looking from the front back. I mean, nobody's having a good time in there. And uh, so Darla was going to go up and sing, and I, I, I was aware of this, so I put myself right next to the. The center aisle, and she's up there singing, and I'm going, just smiling away, you know. Boy, I was just enjoying it. She come up after the service, and she goes, "You were the only one that acted like you were happy I was up there, you know." And I went, "In that, I knew what it was going to look like up there, and that is sad. It, we are, we're worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we act like a bunch of." Uh, well, that's I what, think a lot of it is the desire to be. It is a desire to be reverent, and what 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 has resulted from that in uh, in Christianity is people saying you you uh, Catholics, you you Lutherans, you Methodists in the old day, you are so somber. We're just going to go the opposite, and we're going to make it a party. And it's not a party in a manner of speaking. It's it is a very reverent, solemn thing, and you have to be fed both law and gospel, which is what Jim was talking about. You have to. Be convicted of your sin. Otherwise, why would you even have a need to go to communion? So if you've been convicted of your sin and you're heading down to communion, my thinking is you're not going to be smiling a whole lot because you just are thinking a lot about why you need to go down to communion. But yes, once you've received that communion... Well, when we used to do the um, blessing right after, before you left the rail, I remember feeling a whole lot different leaving communion then now when I have to go back to my pew and wait 15 minutes to receive that. I was set. Go now in the peace and, and of the Lord to, to love and serve the Lord, whatever. I walked away feeling much more up inside, at least, even if it hadn't made it to my face yet. Now I have 15 minutes before I get that. It's kind of weird to me. Well, if you get right down to it, though. <laughs> Come on, Jim. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, <clears throat> when the pastor says, may the body and blood of Christ, which is blah, blah, blah. What? That's just a <laughs> yeah. blah, blah, blah. Right, blah. right. You know, <laughs> yes, I know the words, okay? I've been a Lutheran my whole life. When a pastor blesses you, that's really just a prayer. I shouldn't say just a prayer. It's a, it's a pious wish. The real work that I've done by the What's sacrament. What's a wish? Gary, <laughs> my point is this. The real work is being done by the sacrament. True. It's just like after the pastor baptizes someone, they usually bless them. Well, it's not the blessing that forgives the sins. It's the baptism that does it. The, the prayer is basically emphasizing what's already been delivered. I'm not saying we shouldn't say the words, but the peace of God, which passes all understanding, has already been delivered to you. Right. That's all I'm saying. It's just putting it into words. And it's like and why it's being why, said is a noble thing. Why do we do the benediction and the sending, as it were, at the end of the church service? Why don't we just say, well, you all got it already, just leave. Because you send people out. What's the last thing you heard before you left the church? I don't want to abolish the benediction or any other blessing. I'm simply saying what a blessing is. There's a difference between a prayer and a sacrament. Sure, yeah, yeah. That's all I'm saying. So... What was once for all delivered? In in this passage, which we're going to actually get through the second verse, hopefully. In this passage, he talks about something that was once for all delivered. What does once for all delivered mean? It's delivered one time. It was delivered once. Christ died for us one time. That's for all time. Nothing is going to supersede this faith. It was if 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 I give you, it's like saying. Here it is, and there's nothing more. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. He did it initially, I think, is what he's saying. That he's talking to a group of people like a congregation like Paul was, and he probably went there and delivered this gospel. Now he's coming back and finding that all these other things have come in and they're falling away. He's referring specifically to this, to the faith. Yeah. The faith was once for all delivered to who? To the saints. Which is everybody in the church. Uh, when I see just the quotes there, once for all delivered, 
I think in Jesus Christ. Uh huh. He was once for all the living. Yeah, it is finished. Did Jude at any time go like Paul go to have a congregation or a group of Christians? Or is that known? I missed that memo, so I'm not sure. We don't know. There's so little we know about Jude. There's so little known. There's a couple verses in the text that are questionable. So that's why Luther said it's. So what would it, what would it mean if if this is the faith the faith right nothing will supersede the faith what would it mean to offer other doctrines well it would mean to offer false teaching falsehoods if it's another doctrine it's just not what was delivered it was I received from Paul or whoever I'm passing it on to you and I haven't changed it don't you change it. Another gospel. It would be another gospel, like Jim was saying earlier. I've got an Israeli army cap I like to wear just to kind of mess with people's minds. <laughs> and, uh, okay. The other day, a Christian, remember this church, saw me with that hat on. He says, Yeah, he says, uh, What do you think about the Jews? I said, I think they're in a world of trouble because of blah, 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 blah. He goes, No, what, what about uh, what God's going to do for them? Really? And I, he said, well, yeah, God's not done with the Jews yet, and God's going to get something prepared or planned for them all way into heaven. And I said, so you're this once for all is not. He said, and that this is a strong Christian in this church mm -hmm. who believes that there is a there's a backup plan God's got. That he's going to say, okay, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But also be born in the seed of Abraham. Yeah. So I don't know if we talked about that in our Bible classes so, or from the pulpit because I've heard people in Bible classes say, well, you know, you know, why would God rebuild Jerusalem? It'd be like uh, somebody uh, moved to Washington. Why wouldn't we rebuild Washington like that? And I think it comes from the environment that we're living in here. We've got these um, three dispensationalists, three millennial dispensationalists. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. That that are that they don't understand that we don't have a theology in our, in our church, so we're able anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, hang on a second. It does get talked about, but only if you're in, willing to sit through two and a half years of Revelation, because it came up all the time during the Revelation class. Mm -hmm. It comes up all the time in most of the classes that I've ever taught, because even when I did the That the World May Know series, because that's we're surrounded by that, not only in our area, but in, in American Christianity, that... God has a separate dispensation for the Jews, and therefore we don't... It, what is that really saying? I used to say this in the Revelation class. What is that really saying? It's saying, well, you don't have to tell them about Jesus. You don't have to evangelize to them. You don't have to share the faith with them because God's got a different plan for them. Well, you're just saying you don't want them to be saved. They believe that, too, though. They believe they're saved because they're sons of Abraham. Yeah. That's their... That's their John the Baptist has some choice words. Ken, real quick. What would... Uh, I mean, if that point was emphasized, how many new people coming to this church, if they heard that point emphasized, would come back? How many new people do we have coming That's not the that point. actually believe that? It's, it's not, it's it's not, not in what, the new member class, I can tell you that. It's what? It's not in the new member class. We don't cover that. They don't cover that. Right. It's just a lack of addressing it, though, because one of the things I want to do in here next is talk about all these things that that are in the church that are believed, they're, they're called proof texts or cliches or whatever, that we believe, uh, a, a lot of them, I used to at least. Um, and it's things like, God has a separate plan for the Jews. Well, let's dig into the scriptures and figure that out, spend a week or two on that. See, what Ken just said, that's, that is, that's the poison pill for the church. Because we cannot say what we really teach and believe because if we do they'll never come back you think paul would have but i have had that same attitude and i'm not criticizing you can i'm saying that's that's in the church yeah. 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 Well, you can't do that mr jim i remember there was a fellow i can't even remember who it was but or where he was from but he came and he was a guest speaker here at church and during bible class i think and he basically said uh he, anyway this guy worked he was a, a preacher. He worked in Israel. And he said he was very grateful for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod because he basically said, 
other than the LCMS and the Southern Baptists, he said, really, there aren't any churches trying to evangelize Jewish people in Israel. In fact, I just read yesterday online, some of y'all may have seen this too, the Vatican just made some announcement that they're officially not going to support any more evangelism efforts among the Jewish people. Because they believe... The Catholic Church is pushing that two covenant nonsense. I'm a little surprised to hear that the Southern Baptists are evangelizing the Jews because they're very heavily geared towards the premillennial dispensational thinking because it's taught in their seminaries. Well, some of them are. Some of, but they're also very disconnected in terms of, there's, you'll listen to one Baptist preacher on YouTube and he'll be like, wow, he actually taught that? That's Lutheran. you know. And then you'll listen to another guy and it's like, he's on the same subject, he's way off because there's no, they don't have a confession that they go to and say, make sure that you're teaching in accordance with the confessions and the scriptures. They have a conference instead. It's like some Baptists are very Calvinistic and yeah. some are very not. Yeah, exactly. So there's a big mix. Okay. We're going to try and get through three here. How should the saints respond to falsehood? The true saints expect no further revelation from God. There's a thing going on in the church right now called the New Apostolic Reformation. It's not really new, new, but it's new, where they're expecting new revelation from God. Yeah, what's the Bible called? It's called general revelation, right? It's God's revealing himself to us. Well, that's good, but that's not enough. You need to have a personal word from God. New Apostolic. New Apostolic Reformation. Yeah, it's the same old stuff, just repackaged. Further revelation from God than, than what he has already delivered. So Jude is writing a letter saying, no, this is something that was once for all delivered to the saints. Don't change it. You know, where, where in scripture does it say if you add to this or take away from this? Revelation. Somewhere in Revelation, yeah. The very last verses in Revelation. Yeah. The very last. Luther had this to say, wicked men will come and they will not persevere. They always have this fault of teaching something different and new. That's what, what these wicked men, these false teachers do. A wicked spirit, not rooted in solid doctrine, causes this. It always looks for something new and a better doctrine. If they even like doctrine anymore, doctrines become kind of a bad word. I've had that discussion with people. Wow, you're just all about that doctrine stuff, like theology. You're just all about that theology stuff. Well, without doctrine, there is no church. Oh, I don't agree. There's all kinds of churches without doctrines. All kinds. In fact, I would say most of them don't have a doctrine. They have doctrine, they just don't state it explicitly. Luther also went on to say we should labor above, uh, over this faith and contend for it to the end. The flesh becomes sluggish. It sees to it that we forget the word and grow tired of it. Kind of addresses a little bit what Ken was talking about the last week. The bishop should not worry that he is often teaching the same thing. Paul opposes diseases of doctrine, that his doctrine should be right, stable, and constant. If it ends up coming across as boring, then there's something wrong with the hearer probably less than there is with the word that's being preached. Talk boringly. Yeah. That can happen too. That can happen too. Except I've listened to some sermons from very early when they first started recording radio, and those guys are about as dry as you can get, but the message they have to communicate is so on. It's like I was listening to a sermon from the 40s or 50s, and it's like they were talking about today because it was post World War One or two, rather. And I was like, wow, that's like they're talking about today. I think. Uh, Sermons and services are boring compared to rock concerts and entertainment today. And if that's what people, you know, live with, uh, then something less lively. But you got to, you know, I'm surprised some churches don't use fireworks and smoke. And that probably they do. They do. They do. Fireworks. Some, fireworks. some do. On a stage, like. Sure. Okay. I'm, see, I'm just sort of naive. Yeah. Those who do not have a doctrine that is sure and constant, don't teach. Just get out of get out of the teaching business, you know, because you'll be judged high, much more strictly. You know. Uh, that doesn't mean that that within um, 
any given, if I talk long enough, I'm going to tell you guys something wrong. I don't mean to. It's not my goal. But I may, my opinion may come through and it may not be, be right. That's why we have a group of men here to pull each other back to the, to the truth. See, that's what doctrine does. Otherwise, you can be a false prophet and be unaware of it. Well, we're going to do verse 4 next week. We may get into 5 and 6, but I don't think we'll get to Jim's favorite next week because he wants to get into the uh, the Balaam stuff and the... Oh, Enoch. Enoch stuff, yeah. That's way down the line. That's going to be like... In we did get through two verses today, which means this may only be a 15 to 20 week study. That's <laughs> good. I like it. Shall we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for gathering us together to be about the study of your word, Lord, and we thank you for the good discussions we had today. We ask, Lord, that we do stay focused on the faith. We stay focused on what we need to contend for. We ask you to bless our holiday season as well as everyone's holiday season so that we can remember that this is the time we celebrate your advent, your coming into the world to begin the process of, of going to that cross to save us from our sins. Lord, lead and guide us this week, guard and protect us, and bring us back next week to continue our studies in Jesus' name. Amen.